So, uh, just a quick one for myself, uh, Brett Rosenbaum. Obviously, I'm, I'm an English person. Uh, grew up and played this game since the age of 14. And for myself, football was always my number one sport. Uh, I'll say football, American football. Um, as you can see, in terms of my resume, I've recently gone into the NCAA uh, in the last three years or the last two years. Prior to that, though, my experience as a player and coach was throughout Europe. Um, Britain, Germany, played at Lubit Cougars, which was a great experience. Uh, Finland, Norway, Australia. I even had a stint in the Arena Football League. And throughout that whole experience, I saw the sport from many different facets in terms of a pure hobby through to the, the business environment that was the Arena Football League. Um, at the age of 30, I retired as a, a player. And throughout that time, I'd always been a player coach, but I retired from, from both, worked for the government. And then actually in, in 2017, um, I got involved with the women's American football in Britain again as a pure coach. You know, I couldn't play in that league. So that experience for me really um, effectively uh, moved my life direction it, it, towards football again. Um, prior to that, I had, I had kind of made peace with leaving the sport, but getting involved with that. And I realized that I enjoyed coaching for coaching's sake, that I really enjoyed helping other people try and achieve whatever goals they had within the sport. And so I effectively rejoined the sport. And then from that experience coaching the women's, I, I realized that actually I want to get into this, make this my full-time career. Hence uh, why I went to Laverne. That was through uh, Rich Wurzel, who's another British coach now at Akron. And then from there, I went to University of Massachusetts, Minutemen, as a defensive quality control for those in Europe who, who are not quite sure what that means, it, it, you are an off-field uh, analyst, effectively. You look at all of the film, you do all of the data, that kind of thing, and you produce the reports for the coaches. Um, having done that experience, and it was a great experience for many different reasons, I knew that for myself, I wanted to be an on-field coach. I wanted to have a position to, to call my own and, and to mentor and run meetings. And so that's why I applied at McKendry. McKendry were looking for a positional coach, linebacker, and I've now taken that up. My Twitter's on there. Any details in terms of uh, contact numbers, emails, please, uh, you know, contact me and I'll be happy to talk football. But obviously today's session is about block destruction. So what, what's kind of the current state of block destruction? Well, Effectively, a lot of coaches teach what they were taught themselves, what they experienced in high school at club football, and they teach that, and perhaps that's all they know. They take a lot of confidence in that because, you know, it worked for them effectively. But because of that, what we're seeing is a, a huge array of terminology to describe the same thing, block destruction, block shed, block explosion. You know, the, the words keep on escalating for some reason. It's a simple fact of you're trying to defeat the block uh, for many different reasons but what you're also seeing and you see this kind of with the tackling as well and, and with coverage you see a brand building that uses this terminology and coaches are trying to create their own um, kind of legacy with with these fundamental techniques but this can be quite confusing you know as, as a British coach myself, you know, in the early days, I'd look at techniques, I'd hear different words, and I'd think to myself, is this the same technique? Is this a different technique? Is it an iteration of this technique? And if English is not your first language, you know, it can become quite confusing. Or if you don't have extensive experience, you're a new coach, uh, and you're getting involved with, with block destruction, it can really uh, confuse you in the initial, initial understanding. The other thing that I've seen with, with block destruction is this approach to one size fits all. You know, there, there's a, a certain type of technique that a coach likes and they're trying to apply it to every position on the field in every situation. Now, the caveat to that is defensive line. They've been a bit better at using different techniques, but definitely for linebackers, DBs, it seems to be that they're using a one size fits all. And as I go through the, the presentation, you'll see that that's something I kind of rail against almost. Also, I believe it's becoming a lost art because of that. Um, and like you mentioned, there's 
a focus that has shifted onto tackling. And I think over the next few years, we're going to see that focus shift back onto block destruction and how we conceptualize it, how we teach it. You know, what, what are the effective drills? Why are we teaching those drills going forward? So an example I've got here is what, what, what they call the difference. And I think it was Greciano, who's now at Rutgers, uh, was a big believer in this. And they kind of pushed this forward to really re-energize really the Ohio State uh, defense. Effectively, they were teaching a, a punch and pull or punch and snag technique. We use two hands, they get onto the breastplate of the blocker and you extend your arms and you control them and then you either throw them away or you know rip off whatever technique you wish to use. But they applied it in uniform fashion. And this was in response to offensive uh, linemen who got better at using hand placement and, and grabbing, etc. But, you know, as someone who isn't a pro high profile coach, you know, I coach in the, the NCAA, but, you know, who am I to disagree with this? You know, this is Greciano. This is a big time college coach. Well, oh, sorry about that. I've uh, skipped forward one there. Didn't mean to. Give me a sec. Technical difficulties here. I've got an ancient computer as well, so you have to uh, bear with me as my computer struggles. Uh, here we go. Right. Sorry about this. Okay. Right, here we go. And it's loading. Word of advice, if you ever get into coaching in the States, make sure you get the, the latest computer. At the moment, I'm using a lot of desktop computers. So when I realized there was no, um, there was no uh, camera on my desktop, I, I panicked slightly and, and whipped out this old laptop. Anyway, the difference. So it, like I said, it's effectively a, a punch and pull technique. You get your eye line to the chin of the, the blocker, you strike out with the hands to the breastplate, control them, thumbs up, elbows in extend out and then you've got leverage low to high um, but the problem is with this technique rationally and cognitively it's very simple when you explain that you know it sounds easier to do but in practice what you find is that when you come up against a player in a competitive situation actually the head takes a lot of the load uh, and the coaches recognize this and as you can see from this drill it's simply a wide receiver in a db and the defensive back is in red he takes the contact on the helmet. Now, given the um, appetite for, for, or I say the appetite, given the situation with concussions and with the emphasis on tackling to get the head out of the tackle, I believe that this focus will now come into block shed. So the problem with the difference is, as Ohio State says, it uses the head too much. Um, in games and in practice, when you come to a competitive situation, the head takes the brunt of the force. So this is where, when I look at block destruction, um, I'm trying to avoid that. And I'm trying to emphasize techniques that minimize the head contact where possible. Now there's a multitude of techniques, but generally, you know, what's the purpose of block destruction? Well, it's not just to defeat the block. There's numerous things. You're ensuring gap control in the defensive line. You're ensuring that you can maintain your run fits in the second and third levels. You're keeping the integrity of the scheme and the play, and you're ensuring that the players can efficiently pursue the ball carrier. And so with this, in terms of the various techniques, I group them into three concepts. We've got a force, block destruction, a functional, and a finesse. And in brackets there, I've got hand combat under the finesse. So I'll go into what I mean with these. Now, force is all of the block shed destruction techniques that emphasize and use or minimize the uh, size and power mismatch that you might have. If you have a huge 350 pound nose tackle and he can bull rush that center because he's got an extra 50 or 70 pounds on that guy, then, you know, use that advantage. What's it do? What's the a force box shed do? Well, it prevents the creation of new running lanes. It maintains, like I said, the run fits. Forces the ball carrier to redirect because 
the amount of space they've got to either read gaps or make moves decreases significantly. And also it'll minimize any loss of ground or help you to gain ground. Now, with a functional block shed techniques, they're technically a little more complex and we're looking at things like the push pull, like I mentioned with, with the Ohio State, but they're to react to a changing situation. Yeah, you might be going out on a, a stretch play and the running back wants to cut back. With a functional block shed technique, you can react to that. But with a force one, you're committed, so you, you, it's harder to react to that movement. And also a functional block shed technique, you'll cause the ball carrier to momentarily pause or think to react to you. So that will hopefully slow them down. We've then got the third one, finesse. So this is leveraging a speed mismatch that you've got. You've got a faster player, perhaps a DN coming off the edge, and they know they're faster than the, the tackle. And as you see in the picture there, they might swim or use some other technique that is probably more complex than a force one, uh, but faster than a functional one. Now, the issue with finesse uh, block destruction techniques is that you can um, be forced into the wrong gaps, you can mess up the run fits, and then you cause issues for other players in pursuit. Now, with hand combat, this is uh, a set of techniques that you're using the defense alignment because they have to learn how to, to strike with the hands quickly and accurately, early on so if i was teaching these concepts i would first start with the force concept because i don't want to lose ground especially on run defense as the player becomes more competent with that then they move into your functional uh, block shed techniques and or if they've got a significant advantage of speed i might use the finesse of block shed techniques but with hand combat that's something you have to get in straight away and it's effectively this first one or two steps is how you strike with the hands how you mitigate any uh, advantageous hand placement the offensive lineman might have on you uh, coming out of your stance. So force block destruction. These are some of the techniques. I'm not going to go into all of them, but I'll go through one or two. And it's things where you, like I said, you can minimize any uh, size disadvantage and it's to take on and stop the, the force and the momentum of the player coming out at you. Now, some of these are old school, uh, like the forearm shiver, for example, very old school. But as you see, as we go through some of the video, there's a rationale to use that. And here in this video, as it loads up. So the gentleman here, you can see Mike, great guy, but he was undersized compared to the offensive lineman he's facing. He's usually giving up something like 70 to 80 pounds minimum. Now, if he was an NFL linebacker type person, you know, 230 pounds, but he had extensive power to control a 300 pound line, then punch and pull would be a fantastic technique to use. But not everyone has that, especially in D2 and D3 and in the international game. We don't have those types of people. So the issue becomes when you see them go out to take on that block, they might get the hand placement, but the sheer size differential means that they're going to get pushed back and taken out of the play. So is that an effective block shed technique? Well, no, not in that situation. And what you tend to find is a lot of coaches will hold on to a certain technique religiously, even when that technique is failing the player. And we've got another situation here, mismatch in terms of size. And as you can see, number 20, who's out on the edge here, he manages to get in and make contact, but he doesn't get his base low. He gets upended and pushed out. And same thing with 33, gets pushed out. So they're trying to use this uh, punch ball, but it's just not working. So what would I do in that situation? Well, I'll come to the forearm shiver or flipper, as you might, uh, as you might call it. It's, an un, it's for undersized and underpowered guys, usually a linebacker taking an offensive lineman, as I said, and it's to prevent the loss of yardage. Now, some coaches might be saying, well, how is he going to make the tackle? Chances are he won't make the tackle, let's be honest. But if your run fits uh, are worked out properly, if your support, secondary support know their assignments, then they can come in and make the play. 
Obviously, we would like the first player to make the tackle. In some situations like this, that guy is just too small or in his disadvantage that he won't be able to make that tackle. So this is where I try to use block destruction techniques that will mitigate any kind of critical areas or, or extensive loss of yardage. At least with a forearm shiver, the guy can stop any forward progress of that lineman. As you see, he comes in, sets his base wide, and he's taken on 53, the offensive lineman. Now, he's not going anywhere, and obviously we've got a defensive lineman who's going to make the tackle, but it's an example of showing, compared to those previous videos, where the linebacker was getting blown back. In this situation, he's holding ground and forcing that running back to take a different direction. So it's kind of a best of a bad situation. I think that's one of the things we need to realize about block destruction. Yes, we have uh, sometimes a perfect technique, but if the circumstance or the player doesn't match that, then that technique is, is not, is not um, effective. So when I'm teaching a, a forearm shiver, what's the, what's the uh, coaching points? Well, I want to have that guy make contact with the front of his body. I don't want him hitting with the side of the, of the body. Now, if you do find a player hitting with the side, uh, side on, look at his feet, because usually his feet are pointing away from where he's trying to, to do the block destruction. Um, and as soon as you make contact, you want to have contact with the shoulder, just like you would in, a, in, a, in the profile tackling. Then you use the forearm to get underneath the uh, breastplate to shove that breastplate into the offensive lineman's neck and then to get leverage on him and start to work him backwards. And if you've got the hand to get on the side of the, the shoulder epaulet uh, on his shoulder pads, then you can ride that into, the, into his ear hole effectively. It's a technique which 20 years ago would have been commonplace. It fell out of fashion, but I think with the... Uh, ongoing trend or lighter defensive linemen, lighter defensive uh, linebackers, that these techniques are coming back into fashion because, like I said before, they can minimize the loss of, of yardage and run plays. So as this video loads up, we can see here, number 46, linebacker, very strong guy. He takes on the, the player. He uses the forearm uh, shiver and he holds his ground. Now, he might not make the play, but he'll cause the running back to either bounce out or he'll cause a pileup, as in this situation. And, you know, as long as the team, as long as the defense is making the play in the tackle, then that's not a bad scenario at all. Okay, the worst thing is, like we saw before, where they get blown out completely. Now, another technique which obviously defense alignment are very used to, and you, you know, coaches, you've heard this yourselves, ball rush technique. You've got a player who's significantly bigger or stronger than his opponent and he wants to push him back and, and get an advantage in the backfield and, and move the line of scrimmage. So what's the coaching point here? Well, hands lead the helmet, um, aim for the breastplate or the armpits, thumbs up, elbows are in, and you keep your feet moving forward but in short choppy steps and keep the base wide. Why is that? Because you don't want to get a double teamed or, or a blindside hit. Now. In this scenario, as we can see, the, uh, the nose tackle here, he explodes out. What I don't like about this video is that he doesn't get his hands out far enough and his head does take some of the contact. That's obviously something which you need to try and minimize, but you know, in all honesty, it's going to happen with a ball rush. But you can see the effect here. He's pushed the lineman all the way back. He's caused the runner to reroute and the defense is going to make the tackle, hopefully in the backfield there. So it's a brute force technique. Uh, you can work this on, you know, bags, sled work, one-on-one -on -one pass rush, etc. cetera. Um, what I like to do with all of my block destruction technique uh, drills is to use movement cues rather than a whistle or hut because I want the player to react. That reaction is vitally important. Um, so whenever you're doing this kind of work, that's what I would train them to do. Move on the movement of the offensive lineman. And I might simply stand behind, say, the defensive line if I've got them lined up and working one-on-one -on -one techniques. And I might raise a hand, and then that will be a signal for the offensive lineman to go. I don't like to use sound cues because they can train their ears to that. So watch the feet. Make sure they stay wide, as I mentioned before. 
and make sure they stay low and don't overextend their torso that you don't want to lean into it now here's a drill that um as it loads up apologies for that Again, I'm having technical difficulties. Apologies for this. Let's see if this works again. Okay, sorry about that. So here we've got uh, Coach Douglas, who was that UMass defensive line coach, and using the shoot here to ensure the players come out low. But with the pop-ups, what they're wanting to do is work the hands in advance of the helmet and then keep their feet wide and the base wide. So I'll just play it through first, and you can see real simple drill. They explode out the stance, hands in advance, and they move over the bag. Now, what you want to ensure is that they stay low as they're going out over the bag, okay, and they don't pop up too quickly. And also teaches them not to overextend because they'll fall over the bag. Real simple stuff. Um, the shoot's just an, an extra for that, and obviously not everyone's going to have that, but you could use, for example, uh, a piece of rope or a piece of tape to make sure they dip underneath a broom handle. You know, use what works for you in that situation. But that's a nice little drill there, which you can do for, for ball rush technique, especially off the defensive line. So let's see that in practice and one-on-ones. We've got a defensive end here. Now, what I like about this is that he's setting up the ball rush, okay? So you might have an uh, offensive tackle who's, who's kick-stepping out, he's getting depth. But what you see is that we get a hard explosion here, and then he plants his foot gives a head shimmy and it causes the offensive tackle to get his feet balanced and, and parallel. This is a situation then where you can bull rush the guy and as you see his hands come out in advance and he pushes him back. Okay. So the bull rush doesn't have to be your first move. It can be your second or your third and you can set it up very nicely. So how would they counter this the offensive lineman? Well, they tend to use a hot back. So they'll, get hands on, on your breastplate, they'll widen their feet and they'll effectively jump their feet back to take the power out of the rush. And if they do it well, they'll put their hips into you and they'll keep their torso upright. If they do it poorly, they'll lean into it, in which case then you can rip off and shove that guy into the floor, put his head down. Um, the other way is that they'll slip a hand underneath your pad and they'll shove it up into your neck. And then that way it takes some of the steam out of your rush. Um, if you're a very effective ball rusher, then they'll, they'll change the play, they'll change the scheme, they'll start trapping you and that kind of stuff to, to make you slow down. Now, another technique, Rick, again, you've heard this before. What's it do? Well, he uses a height, uh, a height advantage in terms of if you're a smaller guy, you can get underneath. Explosive off the edge move, helps you keep an arm free, so if you need to go laterally, you can. Now, with this one, again, you know, use what you've got available. If you've got a hat or a towel, you can do that. And what you're trying to do is punch through the knee effectively, getting that low. But also look at the guy's feet. Are they getting their inside foot on the outside of the person who's blocking them? And are they staying low? Are they getting their hips out of the way and leaning into the lineman? Counter move, offensive lineman might lock their arms on you and try and run you out if you're an effective ripper. Yeah, take you past the quarterback, for example. But here's a sim very simple drill that was run by a deed line coach the other day where the player... Oh, there we go. Well, if the video works. But anyway, the player will simply explode out. He'll get his inside foot on the outside of the lineman and he'll grab that hat as best he can. Now, in practice, 
here's some of the issues with the rip. What we find in, in practice and games is that players pop up too quickly. So they're already upright and they're trying to rip. This means then that all of the power's coming out of your torso and your arms. As you can see, that guy's completely upright. He's never going to be able to rip a guy who's got 50 pounds on him. That's why I say rip through the knee. Cause that offensive lineman to try and reach down and play you rather than stand up and allow him to get hands on you. Okay. We'll see again. As you can see, that's how the offensive lineman's going to play you. He's going to get his hands on you. He's going to run you and allow you to keep on going. And this is the thing with a rip. <coughs> You've got to be low. If you're standing up straight away, then it's completely ineffective. Okay. I'll just play that through again. What I do like about this is that he does get his inside foot on the outside of the of, well, He gets his foot and hip away from the lineman. It's just that he comes out too high, so it's ineffective. So functional block destruction. We've got several techniques. We've got a stab technique. We've got punch, pull, snag, rip. Double team techniques, punch and sit, drop knee, and a pull and sit, which is usually for uh, linebackers that, if they're getting pulled back, they're collapsing the block where they are to stop um, any any loss of yardage. So with a stab technique, it's a one arm uh, move. You're gaining space from the, the blocker so you can do another move and it allows you to move laterally and quickly. And the target here, you can work the inside peck to the V of the neck. Uh, I know Coach Douglas at uh, UMass, he liked the V of the neck. I'm more of a... a armpit person I think that's a bit easier it gives you a bit more um, effectively doesn't overexpose you yeah I feel that if you put your hand to the V of the neck then you're exposing too much of your your chest to the offensive lineman whereas with the armpit you're keeping a distance still but with with the stab you don't want to overextend and you don't want to get side on you want to have kind of a 45 degree relationship and again you know with the drills work this hand shield, one-on-one, -on -one, et cetera. What's our offensive counter movement? Well, if you lean into it, he's going to chop your elbow and he's going to cause you to collapse and they'll put you into the turf. Or he'll grab your hands and then work his other hand to your chest. So in this drill, it's very simple. Uh, we might have you know, a, a buck or a stand-up end and he's going to work his hand to the V of the neck. And as you can see, he extends. Now, He's not overextended in terms of his torso. He's got an upright torso. He's perhaps a little wide on his feet, but he's got that maximum extension. Now he can play off of that guy if there's any kind of, you know, boot or a toss or any play that goes wide. And so that's not too bad. Okay, we'll see that again. Stands out, strikes out, gets space. And this is the thing with the functional block shed techniques you're creating space for yourself to work another move or make a, a decision or a reaction to the offensive ball carrier, okay? Whereas with finesse and, and force, you're kind of committed. With these moves, you've got an element of decision-making. Now, I call it a punch. You can call it a strike. It's two hands onto the blocker. Real simple here, okay? Now, with this one, and I'm going to go into a bit more, I would like to see him get more extension, okay? This is a bit of a lazy rep from the offensive lineman here, but it's about getting your hands inside. And like I said, with the Ohio State, you know, thumbs up, palms, extension, strike. That's absolutely fine. And he finishes off there. A little wide, but that happens sometimes. So what's the, the point of this box destruction? Well, you're controlling the player more so than with the stab. You've got the ability to move left or right, and it's a grab control, and you've got a powerful release because you've got two hands working. And like I said, there's the coaching points that I've mentioned before, okay? Now, one of the things that we're going to see in the next drill is how you can redirect uh, the blocker. So with this drill, as it loads up, they're already engaged. They're simply going to extend and they're going to work against the force of the offensive lineman, okay? And it's a, a case of pulling and pushing. So if we see that again, as he goes out, his left hand's pushing there, okay, but his right hand's pulling. And the reason why that's important is because it will twist the shoulders of the blocker, 
okay? And if you do it extensively enough, he could work another technique. But for the sake of this drill, it's just simply reacting and getting depth as well, okay? Now, it's, it's often quite good to start with the hands engaged because the issue with a punch technique is that you tend to not see the extension uh, all the time. But what happens when you want to get off the guy? Well, there's multiple ways you can rip, you can swim, but this is uh, something that was very popular with Restivo, who's the linebacker's coach, where he liked to snag or effectively throw or pull. And as you can see, they're, they're striking out and then they're controlling the gap and then they're forcefully pulling the guy down. Now, not everyone has a block, block shed uh, or sled, so you can work bags, you can work players. The main thing is that you get that extension, and this is kind of exaggerated. You see the chopping the feet, the keeping the feet moving. That's because, you know, obviously the offensive lineman's wanting to push you back. But over-exaggerate your drills, over-exaggerate the techniques, because in practice, you're, you're not going to see uh, in competitive situations, so you're not going to see the technique fully performed all the time. So you want to over-exaggerate in the practice. And that's, you know, coaching basics. As you can see here, he's in a competitive situation. But as you can tell, he strikes. He gets his hands inside on the armpits. But what's the issue? It doesn't fully extend, okay? The other thing is that he's turning too quickly. So in this scenario, if... You know, if I was the offensive lineman and I was losing the guy because he was, he had his hands inside me, but he turns his hips that quickly, I take him where he wants to go and I would turn him quicker. Okay, I wouldn't fight that, I would actually utilize it. So you need to teach your players, like we did, like it showed on the, the drill before, to stay square as best you can. This guy gets side on too quickly, okay. There we go. He's got a bit of a lean into it as well, which is a bit dangerous. Now, the other way you can rip off, okay? And the reason why functional um, techniques I tend to teach kind of second to, to force and finesse is because it's usually a combination of two block destruction techniques. And so you've got the, the punch and extension, then you've got, you know, the release method. Is it a rip? Is it a swim? Is it a snag? So here we can see he punches out and then he rips, okay? Now, it was forceful, it was quick, but the offensive lineman, he's not really given him any force. What I'd like to see from this, uh, this defensive player is that he obviously rips through the knee, that he gets real low, tries to pick up or, you know, grab turf. And that's something that you just have to keep on, you know, hammering into him. It's easy to understand these drills. Cognitively, it's easy, but the real... Uh, real performance element is nitpicking and, and, and reinforcing those muscle memory movements over and over and over. You don't want the guys to have to think about this. They just want to do it naturally. Here we've got a punch ball again, and this guy's a bit better in terms of getting low, and he leans into it as well. He gets his hips out of the way, so that's a bit better. But you can always go lower. You can always be more aggressive in these techniques. So what's some of the issues with, with the punch ball? Well, it's player height, uh, poor blocking if you're doing any kind of scout or versus, poor punch and extension, but losing ground as well. And that's, that's again, ties back to defensive players in terms of size and mismatch. Sometimes they, they think they're doing the technique right, but actually as they're extending their arms, they're giving away too much ground. And at UMass, we saw this against Army. You know, Army pounded the football on us and we tried to use these techniques against linemen who were just taught to simply drive forward you know drive block the guy work through his knees move forward move forward and as we were block shedding yeah we got off the blocks but we'd already given up three or four yards by that point so you know is it an effective effective technique no because we didn't meet the situation where it required so this is an example of a guy who, in my book, doesn't do the technique correct at all. As you see, he loses two or three yards. He's upright straight away. Um, he does get his hand placement not too bad, you know, but his left hand kind of overshoots the shoulder. That's why I say arm, aim for the uh, armpit, because if you overshoot, at least you can hit the top of the shoulder. Because if you aim for the shoulder, 
you can deflect and go over the top of it. But he's given up too much ground. He's not fully extending his arms and he's starting to turn his hips. So this is the worst case scenario that you lose ground. He gets off him, but he gets off him too late, you know, too, too far back. Now a double teams, and I'll put this into the functional because a double team requires, again, thought and, and kind of like a double movement. In this situation, uh, we can see 53 here, um, the lineman, the centre. He's taken on the nose tackle and his uh, guard is helping him. Now, if you don't effectively take on the double team block, you'll get ridden down the line and you become effective. Now, what this guy's trying to do is sit, but he attacks the gap. Okay, now... This is, this is the issue. If you attack a gap, you're not taking on either alignment. That situation, then you expose your, your side to the, the guard or the second guy coming in, and you're not creating any force on, on the player that you're trying to take on. So he gets easily stood up. He doesn't really split him because by that point, he's already controlled and he's just getting pushed down the line. So when I'm talking about double team block shed technique, there's two of them that I like to use, either punch or sit or drop in the knee. And I tend to use punch and sit if the guy is not particularly mobile, he's not particularly experienced, because drop in the knee is actually quite a, an intricate movement. And it can be dangerous and it can cause issues if you don't know how to get up quickly. So with the punch and sit technique, the aim is that you're taking on a player, okay, you take on the guy that you're shading and you sit. Now, this guy, again, he gets stood up, but at least this time he does take on 75, or I think it's 76. At least he takes him on, okay? He, he aims his hands onto the armpit and the V of the neck of this guy. But what he needed to do here was effectively wind his face and sit, okay? And that's to keep the hips a part of the offensive lineman so they can't click them together and move them back. And then he can occupy that gap and cause the, the running back to redirect. Don't do too bad of a job because obviously the running back does redirect, but then he stands up and he, he gets ridden down the line. Now, if you've got a lineman who's a bit more, um, you know, a bit faster, a bit more mobile, this is from Miami Dolphins and it's dropping the knee. Now, what you'll see with this is that they do attack the shoulder of the guy they're shading but they tend to turn the hips a little too soon, okay, in anticipation of that second block. Really, you want to react to that second block. So you see he comes out, gets his hands out, but already he's turning his hips prior to contact from that second guy, okay? You want to react to the, to the guy, not, not anticipate it. But this is where... I'm saying you need a lineman who's a bit more mobile, a bit more experienced, because you are putting yourself in a vulnerable position. Okay, But what you'll find is that afterwards, if they're good at this move, they'll strike, they'll control the player in front of them, they'll drop the knee, to stop the hips of the lineman getting together, and then they'll pop up afterwards Okay, and, and split, split the double team. But again, you can work this drill with hand shields, uh, if you have a block shed uh, machine, great. But it's something you do need to work because the worst case scenario is defense alignment, you get pushed back two or three yards. Your linebackers who are lined up five or six or whatever distance you want to line them up, immediately their space to make decisions and pursue and, and look for cutbacks is cut in half. So the chance of them being on the play over the top of the, of the runs is, is reduced. And then it causes issues for the secondary as well as everyone's getting pushed back. So this is something I definitely like to work. Now, with the punch and swim technique, okay, this is kind of crosses both the boundaries of, of functional and finesse. With the swim technique, really, you want to slide over the shoulder of the blocker, okay? A lot of people don't like the swim because they feel that it exposes the armpit. But as long as you strike and control and pull the, uh, the blocker, okay, you can slide over the shoulder of the player and 
release quickly and obviously if you're taller than the guy then then you know it's a technique to use if you're smaller then you're really going to have to have a very powerful punch and pull technique to swim over the top in which case i'd you know say to that player perhaps you should work a rip instead they're here simple drill start engaged and with this one we're working an exaggeration of the pull segment okay so you pull Pushes, he's making his decision, his feet are chopping, and he slides, okay? And if you do it correctly, if you are aggressive with that pull, then the guy's head might dip, and then it's easier to slide over the top. So you're not exposing your armpit. And what you know is, is that he comes out low, he stays low. What I'd like to see from him, though, is that he forcefully... Uh, hits with his sliding hand onto the butt of the guy that he's blocking because if you you know if you hit the guy's butt hip or, or lower back the chances of him being able to turn and recover are reduced i'm not saying it's going to stop him but it reduces it and also he'll feel it you know be aggressive with this technique and again we've got on the other side here extends what i don't like about this one though is that he does extend and that's good but he's overextended you see how he's leaning into it so if i was the offensive lineman here and he was overextended like that i'd want to push his shoulders down into the floor but also he's swimming and he hasn't really affected the, the blocker the blocker's still upright if the counter move in this situation from this guy would be that he would then get a hand to the to the v of the neck of the defensive player and then he would shoot his hand to the hip to slow down this swim but unfortunately whenever you're doing block destruction and, and you're the offensive dummy as it were you need to make sure they're giving a proper rep because it really is uh really affects the quality of the block destruction technique if the offensive guy's not giving a proper look in that scenario so double teams don't lose ground especially in line of scrimmage if you push back then collapse the pile yeah, there's no good in you being upright but sent back five or six yards. You're causing issues for everyone else. Collapse the block on the spot. Aim to split the hips. And if you're a mobile guy, you know, play the knee through. If you're not mobile, sit down, widen your feet, and just hold your ground. So finesse block destruction, as mentioned, the, the swim and slide there. We've got stab and club and chop and the spin. So with the spin technique. I don't mind it being used whenever, I, whenever I'm coaching linebackers at the defensive line. I don't like it with defensive backs because they tend to rely on it too much. But with defensive linemen, I like it to almost be kind of the, the, the advanced levels of their block destruction. If they can't demonstrate a bull rush and a punch and pull, then I'm not going to go to the spin because they're going to give up ground too quickly, too much. But if they do get to a point where I'm, I'm happy to start teaching the spin, then I like them to use it when the offensive player is being overly aggressive. Yeah, when they're when they're kick stepping so much that they cause the inside gap to open, or they're turning their hips to try and catch up with a, a speedy D end, for example. I don't like it being used with linebackers. That's just my personal preference because again, I feel that they will be forced out of their their assignment and position they'll lose their run fit and then if you're a defensive back or safety and you're trying to come in and help with the box you're not sure where to aim them because the guy who should have been in one position is now in another and then you're having to change your um run fit and it it just creates gaps that the running backs exploit so i tend to to really only use it with defense alignment um, the linebackers have to be pretty exceptional at all the other techniques for me to want to use it with them. And I try and discourage as much as possible the defense backs using it because they tend to over rely on it. But if I am going to use it, then I'd like to set up it's an issue with an initial move, yeah, a fake head, head fake or, or a hard step to try and get that offensive lineman to overcommit. The placement then, I want the foot that I'm going to be... Uh, spinning off i want that to to be put on the midline you know split the blocker down the middle i want that put on the midline so that when i'm spinning i'm spinning on the inside shoulder of the guy 
and I want to use an aggressive hand strike to the inside hand so that they can't recover and hit my hip and then finish off with a very aggressive elbow that will come around and help rotate you and, and hit the, the blocker in the back as you're going past him. And you can drill this you know, with uprights, rugby posts, for example, one-on-ones, bags. You don't need any special equipment. So in terms of the film, we have a look here. Now in this one, okay, he's the, the nose tackle's overcommitted to one side, okay? He's in a precarious situation because the center's got hands on both of his armpits, on his breastplates. So he's desperate now. And the nose tackle's trying to use the spin to get out of a bad situation. This is why I don't like to teach this technique early doors because the issue here is not that he doesn't spin well. The issue is that he doesn't strike out with the hands initially. He doesn't get a good initial explosion or, or a get off. So he's using the spin to get out of, of that scenario. But he's spinning on the outside shoulder of the, of the offensive lineman, which means that when he's rotated around, he's now just simply square up. And it's easy for the lineman to recover. So this is, this is my pet peeve with the spin. It's used often by linemen to get out of a bad situation. Okay. Whereas in this situation, the nose tackle could have, you know, ripped. Perhaps he could have, you know, reset his, uh, his hands and tried to extend. Instead, goes for the lazy option, tries to spin. Now, this next video is where I do like to see the spin used. And he sets it up very nicely here with a head fake, he causes the offensive lineman to overcommit and then he spins in onto the uh, the inside foot of the lineman. And it's fast, it's effective, okay? He causes that 64 to, to turn his hips outward, okay? Perhaps I would have liked this inside foot to be a little more to the inside foot of, of the offensive lineman on the spin, but he does it aggressively. And what you notice here, if I can pause it properly, okay? is that the arm is aggressively, or the elbow, sorry, is aggressively coming around, yeah? And that turns and rotates his hips quickly and his head, and then he can use that to get off of the offensive line. This is a scenario where I do like it to be used, but to get to that level, okay, it takes finesse, it takes all of the other techniques to be perfected first, in, in my personal view for this to be effective okay it's not to get out of a bad situation it's to capitalize on a strong position so that's from the spin now hand combat and block, block destruction it is about hand speed it's about the first or, or initial steps of the defense alignment as they're coming out and it would be things like hand or elbow grab some people they like to grab elbow to bicep uh, I tend to go for the elbow because if you shoot high, at least you're grabbing the, the bicep. If you shoot low, then you're grabbing the hand. Yeah. Whereas if you aim for the hand and you miss, then you're grabbing it. And that's simply you grab it and then you might work another technique like a swing or a rip. A wave rip is where the offensive lineman's got both hands on your breastplate and you move your hand inside of theirs over the top and then you rip on the hand that you're trying to get off and that causes them then to twist and release or you can use a, a, a wrist strike uh, or a wrist strike to shoulder grab and it's just quick hand movement and and strikes okay and you can work this they can work this by themselves they can work this in the gym they you know you don't need to have shoulder pads for this this is simply hand to hand movement but it's about daily repetition, quick repetition, quick hands. Okay, it's nothing special in that sense. So here we can see that the, the end's coming off. Now he doesn't do a great job, but he's using his hands to try and strike the hands off the offensive player and get off. Okay, and he simply uses a hand slap here. Boom, hand slaps the guy and then he pairs that with a, with a swim to get over the top. Now he gets run out. But the initial movement, he manages to slap down and strike that hand that shoots out to block him. And that's all hand combat is. And that's why I put it in the finesse uh, part of the concepts, because it's all about hand speed. 
Now accuracy is critical. Here we see again the end he's try or 97, but he doesn't accurately strike the hands. And what's the result of that? Well, the result is hand placement on his chest. And then he's having to try and mitigate against that. Now this offensive lineman, he's he's pass blocking, but if he was run blocking, he would simply pull that defensive lineman and he'd run him out. And this is where you really need accuracy of hand combat because if you miss initially you're you're setting yourself up for failure okay so in a nutshell um you know I, th there's loads of techniques you can go through uh, we don't have time today to go through all but with block destruction it's about why you're using the technique that you're using okay and the implementation of block destruction in these concepts is about overcoming a player mismatch, a deficit, or maximizing an advantage that guy has in a nutshell. You need to look at the maturity of your player. Do they know enough about the blocks they're facing to use the techniques that they're using? Okay. If they don't understand why they're using their technique to mitigate against the offensive uh, lineman or the, the running back's blocking style, then you're doing them a disservice. Teach them why, okay? And have they con have they mastered the simpler techniques? I tend to think of the force block destruction techniques as the simpler of, of the techniques. It doesn't require thinking as it works, pure reaction um, and explosion. But if they do start to master those, then you can move on to some of the more complex ones. Now, in the past, and I say in the past when I was in Britain, I used to teach a lot of these techniques to linebackers and defensive linemen. And what I found actually was that whilst they conceptually understood them and they could perform them, when it comes to their game, they tended to favor one or two. And when I come to the States, uh, and believe it or not, time's actually quite limited here when you're coaching. You only tend to have perhaps at minimum UMass, we had an hour and a half of practice a day, whereas some other programs might have two to three. But believe it or not, even with that amount of time, and you could be practicing three, four days a week, really, the players only have the capacity to perfect a primary and a secondary technique. And the reason why I say primary and secondary is because each player that I'll, I will coach, I will say to them, you know, what have you learned before? Because you, you've got to take that into account if they're a, a, a player who's played in high school, now in Europe, you might be lucky enough to have a play who's perhaps only done one or two years, so they've not embedded any specific techniques. But if they have um, trained a certain technique, then take that in consideration because it's all the muscle memory. Then you want them to perfect that technique to such an extent that they do not have to think about it whatsoever and they simply perform it and react. That's what we're trying to achieve. Now, if you're a boxer, MMA guy, or you know anything in that kind of combat realm, you know that the techniques have to be performed, you know, rep after rep after rep after rep, and that's why I tend to go with primary and secondary. One that maximizes their strengths, the primary technique, and the secondary is the complement to that technique. So if I was coming out against a player and you know I'm 300 pound lineman and I ball rush the uh, center but he can handle and he has perfected the, the hop technique to take the power out of that rush, then I would use my secondary. And the secondary might be, you know, a hit and rip style, or it might be a punch and pull that is capitalizing more on speed compared to brute force. And that's for you to really, you know, work through with your players. Now it becomes difficult because if you've only gotten for one, one or two times a week in practice, then, you know, you might not have the time to rep out and find out what these techniques are. So initially, you might have a uniform approach to your players, but over time, work with them to find out what secondary technique you can do. And that really starts to, to um, develop the mastery, okay? Knowing what techniques your players will become stronger and how you can capitalize on it. Now, in terms of drills, you know, it's no good me giving you one or two drills and say, you know, run this, this is the perfect drill. If it's the same thing you've learned from this talk so far, it's, it's how do you adapt the techniques to your specific situation to the player in the context that you're in? You know, if you've got a complete rookie and you've only got cones, 
perhaps you have one hand shield, you know, start off with a closed drill. That is, you're going to instruct them through the steps of that drill. You might want to count them through and have them perform it at a you know, slow speed so they get the technique and then you can speed it up and then you might have them react to the player to perform that technique. And I do that even with, with you know, the NCAA guys, you know, Division One guys last year, we would take them and count them through initially because believe it or not, some of the guys had never worked these techniques or they thought they knew, but actually had some bad habits and it's a good way to ensure that everyone's on the right level. And then you can open it up. You know, you might then have them start off a step or two from the ball, you know, from the blocker, sorry, where then they need to connect the block shed technique to their footwork, to the reaction of the player. Then you might have it where you have a left and a right option. So that opens it up a little bit more. Or you might allow the ball carrier to change directions and it's, you know, not predetermined. And so you take the drill from simple, closed, instruction led to an open, multiple scenarios. You know, you might say to a player, to a veteran player who's working their block shedding, uh, block destruction techniques, say, look, work your primary and secondary, but you choose. And then you've got, you know, a pod situation. We've got two, you know, two linemen, a running back, perhaps you have a tight end or a full back in there. And it just takes that technique from, the fundamental instruction led through to the situation and you can control the intensity throughout that. So in terms of time, you know, how much time would you dedicate in practice? Well, even, even over here, you might only get five or 10 minutes, 10 minutes max perhaps to even do uh, individual periods or a specific part of your individual uh, fundamentals, you know, at UMass, we only had like five minutes. And so we effectively only worked one technique. I, that wasn't my choice. That was the choice of the coaches. So in terms of your practice, you know, if you're working 10, 15 minutes, that's a luxury. It really is. Um, so make sure though, that you try and get the players outside of practice to work this in the gym. If they've got a boxing bag or anything like that, or they meet up with their friends and, and fellow players that they're working these techniques they can work it on air. They can work it on each other without pads. Obviously, you don't want to strike too hard, but you can work the speed of these techniques. And really, the emphasis is as many reps as the quality reps as possible, working from a, a non uh, pressure environment to a high pressure environment game situation and, and graduate them through. If you find that you've taken a player up, say they're doing the punch and stag technique and they're doing it great in a, a closed drill where there's cones and you're, you know, instructing them, but they struggle with the open situation, game like situation, you know, set up the drill then where they can work it in an open game situation, but have everyone do it at 50% speed. It might simply be that they've not repped it through in that open situation. So they can do that. There's still an element of surprise. It's just everyone's going slower. And then once you've worked that through, speed it up and, and then you can do that technique at game speed. Now, in terms of the game, you know, in, in the US where we have a luxury of a lot of great film, you know, we get film from multiple angles, tight view, uh, sideline view, you know, wide end zone view. In Europe, you might have a wide view and that might be it. You know, you might have a, an end zone view, which is great. But what I would say is if you're in a situation where you don't have the film on the opponent and you're coming in blind and you don't know how their offensive line is going to be, then set up a strategy for how you're going to attack that offensive line or the, the offense of the linebackers. And, you know, test out in a methodical way how you're going to use your block destruction techniques. So the worst thing is that you send out your players they do a technique, you don't know what it is. Some of it worked, some of it didn't work. And when they come back, you don't have the time to process who, who is in a mismatch situation, who has an advantage. You know, it might even be as simple as you send out your defense line and say, look, everyone bull rush. I want to know who's got the advantage of, of power and size first. Yeah. Then after that, you know, the offensive line obviously get change things up but you know they're going to change things up. So after that, you might say to your defensive line, right, whoever's, uh, you know, ball rush worked, do it again, see if they adapt. 
the other players, now let's go to your secondary technique. Let's punch and pull, let's hit and rip, see how they react. And that's where then your coaches and your defensive linemen, your linebackers should be watching. They can, they can process that information so that when they go in, they know what techniques are working. If you find your, your players are using both their primary and secondary techniques and either work, well, it's time to, to swap up the, the personnel, move people around, sub the players out. Use someone whose technique will provide that advantage. Don't be afraid to do that. So in a nutshell, hopefully I've given you a, a framework of concepts to start looking at what techniques are applicable to your players in your context. It would be erroneous of me to say, everyone jump on a you know, hitting sled, and just do the punch and pull, that's your technique. That's not gonna work for 80% of the people in Europe because you probably don't have the, the equipment or if you do, it's being used by someone all the time, you can't get on it. You need to find the drills and the techniques that work in your situation, but now you can conceptualize it. Which ones are force, which ones are gonna enhance that size and strength mismatch, which one's going to enhance our speed, you know, which guys can do the more technical functional um, block destruction techniques. What's the primary and secondary as I went through and, and how can we master that repetition? And how can we evolve the drills from instructor led to open drills? And, and ultimately, you know, block, block destruction is about maintaining gap control, ensuring that your run fits are, are sound and you keep the scheme integrity. Without it, if your players are getting blown out of position, if you're losing ground, it doesn't matter what your playbook does. It doesn't matter how many different plays you have. You can throw it in the bin because your players are going to be anywhere and everywhere. And it will cause a, a huge issue as you go from the first, second to third level, from the D linemen to the DBs. If you're expecting your defensive backs to, to be involved with the run game, especially in the box, you need to make sure that the players are taking care of business up front. The second that multiple gaps are created or uh, the line of scrimmage is moved um, forward against you, your defensive backs, uh, uh, you know, the chance of them being effective is severely diminished. And that's ultimately how I look at block destruction techniques. So is there any questions? Um, did everyone understand my English accent? I'm always a bit conscious that I perhaps talk too quick. No, no, it was great, coach. Um, every time I, I noted something down um, to ask a question, you, you answered it later. Um, I only have one, one thing on my mind um, I like to ask. Um, what um, or how, how much do you coach the footwork on the block destruction techniques? Absolutely. So if I find a situation where the player is getting uh, side on, that is that their hip is making contact, hopefully you can see me again, there, where the hips making contact or the side of the shoulders making contact rather than, you know, the, the top of the shoulder or the hands are striking out and you're not getting square. I immediately look at the feet because often they one of them's turned away. The other one might be outside of the feet of the person that's trying to block them. And that will then cause the hips, the knees and the hips and ultimately shoulders and the rest of the body to turn. That's then when I start to really emphasize the, uh, the placement of the feet. Now, if it's a complete rookie, again, instruction, count them through the steps, you know, step one, you know, split the blocker, step two, you know, shoot the hands, hit the armpits, depending on what your technique is. So I will instruct them initially. And then after that, as they're doing the reps, you know, like live that they're taking them through from stance through to the block shed. I will only re-emphasize if I start seeing that side on movement uh, or a, a favoritism to a certain side, then I'll look at the feet and see where they're pointing. And that's the same for tackling as well. If you find you've got a player who comes in to make a tackle and they're trying to hit with the side of the feet, which uh, grew in, in um, which kind of grew out of this like hunt step mentality, look at the feet straight away and see where they're pointing. Because the second you tend to redirect, they'll start squaring up and, and making proper tackles and block destruction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, coach, that's, that are amazing tips you, you offered to us. Um, if you like to, I've got one other question. Um, how do you teach the spill technique? 
how to spill, for example, for an outside linebacker? Um, yeah, abs absolutely. Um, so with the spill technique, I tend to uh, play them to wrong arm. That is, you know, take their outside arm through, punch through the knee, and then work to the far knee, okay, and, and crawl through. Um, again, emphasize wide feet, low base, so that if they if they don't manage to affect them with the rip, that at least their body's low enough where they can either cause the player to, to pile up or, you know, have to move around you uh, rather than getting blown back. The worst thing is that you um, shoot for the, the far side leg and you completely miss or you shoot for the inside leg and you get stood up and blown back. So mm -hmm. does that answer your question there? Yeah, and um, how do you set set up the feet of the uh, defender who spill the kickout block? So with that one, I'd get the outside foot to place on the inside of their outside, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, if I've got, this is the outside foot of the guys yeah. trying to kick me out, I'll place my inside foot here. And then mm -hmm. that means my shoulder then can get into his midline and work through to the far knee. Okay, you try to try to go through his side, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, got you. Yeah, that's great, coach. Um, yeah, they were that um, on my questions. I had some other noted down, but you you answered everything and you offered a great, such a great toolbox for for our coaches and our players to to um, to practice and to learn from. So um, cool. I'm very thankful for your for your. Uh, your talk today. Um, any other questions by the other coaches? Uh, yeah, I, I would have a question about your approach, coach, because you talked about um, that you're trying to get the guys to have a primary and a sec secondary technique, right? Because of yeah. limited time. So what I want to understand is, do you pretty much like pick five or six techniques that fit into your concept? And you teach all of them to the guys and then see, okay, this guy, that's his primary technique and that might be his secondary technique and it might be a totally different one for the other guy. Or do you have like base techniques that you start with and that you say, hey, those are must techniques that we want to teach our guys. And then maybe we have one guy, he's maybe sophomore uh, or junior or already in his senior season and you say, hey, Let's give him another another technique into his toolbox to use, um, so that he because it might fit him. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And um, good question and good good way to articulate it, actually. Um, so going back to earlier with players in the US, I tend to find that there are certain techniques they've ingrained because that's how they did in high school. Or if I come into a new team, the players will learn, you know, a specific set of techniques over a couple of years. So I'll take, with those types of players, I'll tend to choose what I believe to be the strongest technique and I'll make that their primary. And then I'll look at what other attributes they've got. You know, what's the physiology of the guy? Tall, short, heavy, you know, light, long arm, short arm, quick off, the, off of their stance, slow. And then I'll work a secondary technique. Now, if I'm in Europe in this a situation where I've got a guy who perhaps one or two or even three years experience max, then with those players, what I tend to do is work a primary technique in a more uniform fashion. So if it's defensive line, I'll work a ball rush initially. Uh, with the linebackers, I'll work a forearm shiver. And with defensive backs, I'll start working a push and pull technique because I feel that in, in that situation, at least they've got something they can go back to initially that will minimize loss of yardage and it will allow them to then to build off of that base, if that makes sense. And then the secondary technique will be, again, same thing. What's their physiology? What, what kind of blocks and what kind of um, opponents are they facing? That kind of thing. But it's difficult. In, I, I say it's difficult outside the US when you've got limited time because, you know, you might have two or three sessions a week. There's not a lot of time to work that. Um, does that answer your question there? Yeah, pretty much. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, any other questions, coaches? Mm.
No. Okay. Yeah, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think so. But you you uh, you presented so many different ideas. So I'd like to thank you very much. I'll take a handful of notes and noted so much down. I want to do in the next practice when we when we go out and see you guys. And Excellent. yeah, thank you, Coach. Girl. Thank you, Coach, for all the help and what you did for us. And yeah, appreciate I it. I have my fingers uh, crossed for you. I just um, just want to finish finish off really and say, you know, the, the coaches in Europe and and internationally, um, I think that you you're doing a really good job, and I think actually. Um, you're probably better than you realize when, when you compare yourselves to coaches in North America, you, you, you're taking techniques, you're questioning whether, you, you know, the why's behind the techniques and the schemes. And that's very, very important. Whereas in the U S they can kind of sometimes lose that. So, all I'd say to, to, especially the coaches in Germany, I've got a lot of respect for the German league. I think you do a fantastic job of developing coaching staffs. I think you do a fantastic job of teaching the fundamentals to both youth and junior and adult. And, um, you know, just hit me up if you want any more information. Or if I don't know, I'll find someone who does for you. So appreciate you giving me the chance to speak today. Hey, Coach, thank you very much. And have a great day. And let's stay in contact. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Goodbye, Coach. Thank you.